Your interview can go three different ways. One, where you and your interviewer both know the interview is going great. Second, you and your interviewer both know the interview is going badly. And third, where you think the interview is going great, but the interviewer keep thinking, how is this candidate keep giving wrong answers so confidently? If you have given interviews where you thought you did great, but did not get the job, or you gave an online assessment where you thought you did good, but you did not get called for the interview, unfortunately, you fall in this category. Hello guys and girls, my name is Raj. I'm a principal solutions architect working at AWS for more than five years. I have implemented multiple hyperscale real world projects in production. I have written official blogs on them, presented on big conferences like reInvent, KubeCon, AWS summits. But more importantly, I have taken over 100 cloud interviews and in today's video, I'm going to go over some of the questions and answers that most of you get wrong. All right, the first question that most of the candidates get wrong is, how does Kubernetes work on node scale? And the candidate answer like you are scaling a regular virtual machine and they would say, I would just set up the auto scaling group scaling at a particular CPU or memory of the virtual machine. And you think you are giving the right answer, but that is not at all how Kubernetes work on node scale. So how do they scale? First, you will set up a HPA or horizontal pod autoscaler. This horizontal pod autoscaler will work on a set of pods in a deployment. All HPA does is if the resource utilization or average resource utilization across all the pods in that deployment crosses a certain threshold of let's say CPU, memory or some other metrics, this HPA will simply increase the number of replica in this deployment. So let's say the num amount of traffic keeps increasing so HPA will simply increase the number of replicas. And when it creates a new pod, the pod goes in the pending state and the cube scheduler, which runs in the Kubernetes control plane, will try to find a space for that pod in the existing running virtual machines. In this case, this virtual machine has some capacity. So cube scheduler will schedule this pod into the running worker virtual machine no new EC2s or worker VM needs to be created. Now let's say traffic keeps increasing and horizontal power autoscaler will keep on creating new pods. At certain point, all the existing running virtual machines will be out of capacity. In that case, the cube scheduler, which is running in the control plane, cannot find any running virtual machine to schedule this pod in. And this pod will go in pending unschedulable state. And the node autoscaler for Kubernetes, such as cluster autoscaler or Carpenter, they keep on checking if there is a pending unschedulable pod. As soon as they find a pending unschedulable pod, the node autoscaler will create a new worker VM and then the cube scheduler will see that, okay, there is a new worker VM with some capacity available. It will schedule the pod into the newly created worker VMs. Whenever you need to scale Kubernetes worker nodes, you do not create auto scaling groups and try to scale at a certain level for this worker VM. Kubernetes worker nodes do not scale at a particular CPU or memory utilization of these worker virtual machines like your traditional vanilla virtual machines. If you want the incorrect answer as well as the correct answer with all the explanation and the steps in a nice PDF format along with other interview question, click the link in the description and you can download this PDF free of charge where you can study that question and multiple other questions. The next question that a lot of candidates give wrong answer to when they think they are giving the right answer is, how many data centers are in one availability zone? Incorrect answer is one availability zone means one data center. That is not correct. Correct answer is one AWS availability zone can contain multiple data centers. Each zone is usually backed by one or more physical data center with the largest backed by as many as five. So some availability zone has five data center and some has one, but most availability zone has more than one data center. All right, the next question people get wrong is, what is the difference between the 
platform team and developer team. So generally the answer I get is all jumbled up. So this is how the flow looks like. First step, developer requests the infrastructure. Let's say in this case, the developer needs a Kubernetes cluster. So they will file a ticket into a ticketing system such as ServiceNow. Then the second step, the platform team will evaluate the ticket and if the ticket is justified, they will run some sort of infrastructure as code such as Terraform, CDK, etc. And that will create the infrastructure such as Amazon EKS. And this infrastructure as code also has security guardrails baked in. It is following the organization security best practices. Next, once this infrastructure is up and running, the platform team will give the credentials to the developer and then the developer will check in their code and Docker file and YAML manifests into a Git repository. As soon as that is checked in, the CI tool or continuous integration tool such as Jenkins will get started and it will run the Docker file and create the container image and save it into a repository such as Amazon ECR. Next, the CD tool or continuous delivery or continuous deployment tool will get triggered. For example, Jenkins, it will go and update the Kubernetes manifest file with the tag of the container image. And then the CD tool will run some sort of kubectl apply command or equivalent command, which in turn will deploy the container image from the ECR. In conclusion, the platform team takes care of the infrastructure, often with the guardrails baked in, appropriate for the organization, and the developer team uses that infrastructure to deploy their application. The platform team does the upgrade and maintenance of the infrastructure to reduce the burden on the developer team. In some cases, platform team will also provision the agents needed to send the logs and monitoring to the appropriate end services. Those are a couple of questions. I have more questions in this PDF. If you want to download this and just print this and study it before your interviews, click the link in the description and you will get the free guide. What are some other questions that you think you did great but actually was wrong? Let me know in the description and I will answer them in the next video.